Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering onboarding, best practices for HR compliance and employee retention. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service, and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we're wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenters for today's program, Sherry Heller and Amanda Bridge, Sherry is a SHRM and PHR certified HR partner here at MP. She has over 20 years of experience in employee relations, training and development, strategic planning, and policy development. Sherry earned a Master of Education in Instructional Design from UMass. She spent many years in retail management prior to getting into HR, which provides her with a unique business focus to human resources. Amanda is an HR generalist at MP. She currently provides HR support to media, small, medium, and large size businesses in a variety of industries and has pre previously an HR generalist for a 200 plus employee pediatric nonprofit organization. Just a few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Sherry. Thank you, Katie, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we start out with our brief legal disclaimer. Uh, we often talk about employment law, but we are not dispensing legal advice. Uh, we hope that this will be, that you will learn a lot today, but we are not attorneys uh, and this information is uh, for our HR purposes only. All right, so. You've heard the saying, you never get a second chance to make a good impression. And that is why developing a solid onboarding program is so important. Uh, so today we'll talk about what, what is onboarding and the steps for the onboarding process. We'll uh, talk a little bit about on hires, which uh, has been a, a particular challenge for employers uh, through the pandemic. Uh, share some onboarding tips, and then we'll uh, leave time at the end for some Q&A. So as Katie mentioned, uh, if you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, uh, just throw them into the Q&A feature and we will uh, get to those at the end. All right, so what is onboarding? Uh, onboarding is the process companies go through to welcome and integrate new hires into the workplace. This very definition suggests that the employee onboarding process extends far beyond the first day of a new hire it continues until they've fully adjusted to their role and team. Considering that approximately 15% of new hires leave companies within the first 18 months, implementing an effective onboarding program shouldn't be optional. Remember, we gotta make a good first impression. All right, so um, according to Gallup's uh, State of the American Workplace report, only 12% of US employees say their company does a good job of onboarding. That means that 88% of employees don't feel their employer does a good job. Complicating matters further, employers have a brand new onboarding challenge, as I mentioned earlier, helping remote workers develop relationships and learn their role in a virtual setting. Gallup asked employees to describe the most valuable asset, aspect excuse me, of their most recent onboarding experience. Employees shared a variety of answers, but the three most common themes emerged. One is people. For many employees, the most valuable aspect of their recent onboarding experience was meeting people, forming social ties, and learning from their colleagues. New employees want relationships that make them feel supported, included, and respected. Number two was learning. New hires crave answers and learning experiences that will help them reach their full potential. Many employers consider, employees, excuse me, consider learning to be the most valuable aspect of their onboarding journey. Yet only 29% of employees 
say they feel fully prepared and supported to excel in their role after their onboarding experience. And finally, number three, processes. So for many employees, the most valuable aspect of their onboarding journey was simply how it was organized and delivered. Employees want clear expectations for training and orientation, a well-defined onboarding structure, and a pace of learning that makes them feel well-prepared. So organizations place too much emphasis on new hire paperwork and not enough on the new hire's long-term success. So although many employers use the terms orientation and onboarding interchangeably, they are not the same. Orientation happens during the first days and weeks of a, of a job, where onboarding is a process that begins weeks before the first day and ends months or even a year after hire. That continuum of welcoming, empowering, and value, valuing new employees leads to the kind of job satisfaction that results in long-term employees. Orientation meetings are a small part of the overall onboarding process. Onboarding is tailored to the needs of an individual and the role, and it includes training, mentoring, employee engagement. Um, companies are finding that going beyond the initial orientation meetings and investing the time in onboarding individual employee employees pays dividends that are seen for years. So why is onboarding important? because it acclimates employees to their role, the company's philosophies, and what the company has to offer. It also engages employees, creating workers that are committed to the company's success, and it helps retain new hires by making them feel like a member of the team. Now let's talk about the onboarding process. According to an online survey conducted by the Harris Poll, 93% of employers agree a good onboarding experience is critical to influence a new hire's decision to stay with the organization. If new hires don't immediately feel connected and have a clear view of the culture and mission of the organization and their role in it, they aren't likely to stick around long. But onboarding doesn't start on the new hire's first day of employment. Onboarding begins as soon as that job offer is accepted. So let's take a look at some of the steps involved in onboarding. Um, effective onboarding process could include things like various pre-boarding activities, uh, some internal preparation, identifying mentors or buddies, welcoming the new hire on their first day, engaging in role-specific training, and then developing a new hire training plan. We're gonna break down each of these steps. All right, pre-boarding activities, which has absolutely nothing to do with getting on an airplane. That's what I think of when I think about pre-boarding. But here, it's really um, the, uh, the act pre-boarding activities are get new employees excited to work for your company. Giving new employees the first steps of the onboarding process, sending company merchandise to their homes, or sending motivational text messages are ways you can initiate your company's onboarding process. These steps show your new hires the company's commitment to having them on your team. So pre-boarding steps could include things like sending pre-boarding swag or a personalized welcome basket. It's also a good time to ask for feedback about your hiring process where they're fresh off of that process. Um, get a head start on the administrative tasks. So nobody wants to spend their first their entire first day signing forms and setting up accounts. Um, give your new hires the opportunity to get a head start clearing the way for a more exciting day one. Make a list of tasks for new hires to work through uh, prior to starting, including activating their company accounts, maybe email, communication or productivity tools, things like that. Um, verifying personal details for your company directory, um, adding their personal information to the payroll software. Uh, and completing relevant government employment documents uh, such as W-4s, I-9s, state withholding forms, and the like. Uh, next is to answer their questions about what to expect, but before they have to ask them. The source of new hire nerves can be, uh, can be those unknown details. A little information can go a long way in avoiding ambiguity and first aid blunders. So develop a new hire FAQ to answer common questions such as, you know, what time do I arrive? What's the dress code? Where do I park? 
you know, how do I find the front door? Any of you who are familiar with the uh, Cummings Center in Beverly know that if somebody doesn't tell you what entrance to go in, you may never find the office you're going to. Um, what equipment do I bring on my first day? Um, where do I direct my questions? Um, what, what do most people do for lunch? I mean, you want to come prepared. If the company provides lunch, are they going to take you out to lunch the first day? Uh, let them know that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is also a great opportunity to deliver those resources such as employee handbook, benefits guide, and role specific information to help the new hires uh, combat their first day jitters. Um, you also want to clarify the onboarding schedule with calendar invites. Uh, during the hectic first few weeks of a new job, a schedule will keep everybody organized, not just your new hire, but everybody on the team that's going to be part of the onboarding process. Um, so don't delay. Send those invites ahead of time, uh, and that makes the job seem real to that new hire. You can populate their calendar with training sessions, supervisor and coworker meetings, and company-wide events. And then finally, make an internal announcement to prep for a team-wide welcome. Uh, during pre-boarding, one of your main objects, objectives is to cultivate a sense of community. So in the announcement, mention the new hire's name, their role, and their start date. If your company is really large or, uh, and or hires at a fast pace, you might consider uh, including only the new hire's direct team. I know that for our HR team here at MassPay, when we have a new person starting, uh, as soon as we find out that they've accepted the offer, first thing most of us do is go into LinkedIn, send them a welcome message, or if we have their email address, we'll send them an email, but just to welcome them to the team and let them know how excited we are that they're gonna be joining. But I caution you to beware of information overload. It's important to be aware of the overload at this stage of the process. Um, I like this example from social media engagement company Buffer. Um, they broke out the info into a series of communications and documents. They did a really neat blog on um, the lessons they learned as they were trying to formulate their onboarding process. So they start with what they start with what they call pre-start emails, which include a total of five timed emails walking through an ecstatic welcome. I didn't make that up. That's what they say, an ecstatic welcome. They collect basic info, uh, introductions to managers and buddies, uh, an overview of remote tools that they use, uh, and what to expect on day one. That just sort of gets the, the, uh, the new hire uh, excited about starting the new job and, and keeps you connected to them uh, while they're going, while in the interim between accepting the job and starting on their first day. Uh, they have an onboarding form they use where they ask for a name, address, contact info, payroll info, laptop needs, t-shirt sizes, and, and, and things of that nature. Um, and then they provide a central onboarding document where they store all important links in a day-by-day -day checklist of tasks and resources for each new hire to establish a solid foundation on the team. I know we do that, again, on our HR services team. We have a shared um, document where uh, each of us can enter in any, um, any good uh, meetings that we're going to be scheduling with clients or trainings we're going to be doing that a new hire might want to join us on. So we, we all share that document so we know what the new hire has, where they have some openings, um, and where we can help supplement the, the uh, onboarding. Okay, so don't forget that internal preparation prior to the new hire's first day. Um, this includes things like uh, new hire paperwork, um, setting up the new employee's online accounts. Don't forget setting up their company email, instant messenger if you use that, um, HRIS software, um, <coughs> excuse me, company password management software if you use it, um, company productivity software, you know, getting all those accounts set up so they can hit the ground running on their first day. Um, you want to prepare your new hire's tech needs, um, including, you know, laptop, monitor, phone, you know, mouse, keyboard, headset, anything else they're going to need. Um, I saw one interesting company that actually, uh, because they hire so many remote employees, had an account set up with a, um, with a supply company that the new hire could actually go on and order specific things for themselves that they can use for their office setup for remote workers, which I thought was a really clever idea. Um, you want to confirm your employee's uh, new office phone number, make sure that's working, um, order business cards or a nameplate uh, if appropriate, arrange for a new employee's ID card or access fob, 
um, start scheduling those introductory meetings with key colleagues for the new employees first few weeks. And then encourage team members, especially those on the interview panel, to reach out to the, the new hire to congratulate them and welcome them prior to their start date. This really goes a long way in establishing relationships early in the process. And then finally, arrange any relevant internal or external trainings required for the job. So again, their, their first few weeks are, are really full of all the kind of activities that, are, uh, that they're gonna need to come up to speed. You also want to identify one or more mentors or buddies as part of the onboarding process. Um, they can really help introduce the new hire uh, to your company culture and improve retention. A mentor is someone who partners with a new employee during their first few months of employment. They offer advice and guidance to help foster and promote a professional development of the new employee. Um, the mentor knows the ropes and can be an effective uh, source of advice and encouragement. And they offer seasoned experience in the form of training and socializing the new employee to the company. And with an effective mentor, a new employee will quickly become a contributing member of your team. So when selecting a mentor, you'll need to consider some specific criteria. Um, the mentor is generally a peer of, of the new employee uh, who's well regarded by their current employees and displays a lot of patience and good communication and interpersonal skills. The mentor should be a high performer who's skilled in the new employee's job, um, and they should be proud of the organization. And most importantly, they, might, they want to be a mentor. Um, before agreeing to being a mentor, they need to understand the responsibilities of the role. Um, they'll be relied on to uh, be a tour guide and provide introductions and help socialize the new employee. Um, they'll be required to be an informational source resource for the new employee regarding policies, procedures, uh, work rules, et cetera, um, and assist in training and identifying resources for the new employee. Um, here's another great idea from that same social media engagement company, Buffer. Um, they rely on three key people to bring on new teammates, the hiring manager and then two uh, buddies, um, and they call those bufferoos. Um, so first off, the hiring manager, which is typically the new hire's direct supervisor, um, they help select the role buddy and coordinate a roadmap of 30, 60, and 90 day goals. Uh, the manager also gives feedback and keeps connected with the buddies to pass along any vital information um, or corrections to the new hire. Um, and as you can see here, uh, these are just little uh, clips from their website where they actually go over for each of the buddies or, or mentors um, what, they're, what is expected of them in that specific role. Uh, then they assign a role buddy. And this is typically a peer working on the same team as the new hire or a comparable role elsewhere in the company. Uh, depending on how closely the role buddy and the new hire work, they'll talk once or twice a week, possibly via Zoom. Um, and this buddy is the go-to person for any task or role-related questions the new hire may have. And then they also assign a culture buddy. So this person is typically on a different team and selected to help guide the new hire through culture-related discussions and provide additional context on company history and norms. Um, this buddy will chat weekly with the new hire for the first you know, six weeks or so as needed and then thereafter uh, just to be available to them to make sure that they are, are really integrated into the company culture. And now we finally get to welcome our new hire on day one. Uh, you really wanna make sure that that first day's schedule is full of meeting people and onboarding activities. Schedule a good portion of the morning with the new employee's boss and mentor. Um, don't let the day go to waste and contain nothing but paperwork and HR meetings. And yes, I said that I'm an HR person, but I said, let's not schedule all those HR meetings. Hopefully we've, had, we've done a lot of that, that uh, prior to the first day, so that when the employee starts, most of that paperwork is done. Um, the days for bonding with the boss, the mentor, and coworkers, not about filling out forms. Um, ideally, they have completed those forms prior to the first day, and you've sent them benefit information and maybe the employee handbook early so that the new employee can review them at their leisure and then arrive for the first day with questions. You wanna start by giving them a good tour of the office. Nearly every first day starts out with a tour of the facility, 
Um, but that doesn't mean it has to be boring. Um, don't just point out the water cooler and the co uh, coffee machine, but you know, show your new hire where people get together during breaks, uh, show them a good place to get some quiet thinking done uh, if you're in a, a sort of a big you know, cube area um, and give them a sense of what your office is all about. Um, next, you wanna introduce your new hire to their coworkers and the team. Uh, the sooner you can get them assimilated, the sooner they'll feel comfortable and start producing their best work. Uh, they're going to have a lot of new names and faces thrown at them on that first day. Uh, so create multiple opportunities to get to know everyone. I know uh, here at MP, one of the things we do with our new hires that they are, we have, since we're still um, in, predominantly in a remote environment, um, uh, most of our teams have weekly meetings or, or more than once a week. Um, so new hires, regardless of what position they have in the company, will attend some of those meetings. It gives them an opportunity to meet the, uh, some of the people on the other teams um, and really get to understand what those teams are about and how they're going to interact with them. Um, your new hire's workspace should already be set up when they arrive on their first day. You want to give them a clean, stocked, and organized place to work right from the start. Uh, take them out to lunch. Uh, this is one of the best things you can do for a new hire on their first day of work. Uh, not only do you get a chance to chat outside of the work environment, but people love free food. Uh, it also helps to show them some of the local lunch options for, uh, for those who are not remote. Um, and then finally, you want to end the day with friendly conversation. Uh, check in with your new hire before they head home from their first day. Ask them how everything went. See if they have any questions or concerns. They'll leave the office knowing that you've got their back and they'll come in the next day feeling like they belong. Uh, next step is we move into uh, role specific training. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important phases of onboarding and it's directly correlated to how successful new employees will be at their jobs. Without formal training, your employees may not know what it takes to thrive. Um, as a result, they may develop a feeling of dissatisfaction, which can lead to a high job turnover rate. On the other hand, a well-drafted new hire training plan will help employees feel welcome by showing them that you care about their development. So you start out with this role-specific training where um, a hiring manager generally will explain the team, team structure and roles, establish expectations for success, and set new hires up with useful tools and resources. Uh, the role-specific training should include things like describing the new hire's tasks, really talking about what a typical day at work looks like, um, present job-specific tools that the new hire is going to use, uh, provide a list of helpful resources, um, display and explain reports that track the uh, team's KPIs or key performance indicators or metrics. Um, you want to present business objectives related to the new hire's position and team. So they really get that sort of holistic understanding of what their role, how their role impacts the whole organization. You wanna explain the roles of the different members on your team and how that new hire will work with them. Uh, schedule regular one-on-ones with the new hire and also schedule introductory one-on-ones between the new hire and the team members. So everybody will really get, uh, really be able to, to get to know one another. And then we move into the new hire training plan. Um, and again, training is critical to make a new team member feel comfortable in their position, and it gives them the knowledge, tools, and skills they need to become successful and productive members of your company. So an official new hire training plan ensures that training is comprehensive, thorough, and effective. Your new hire training plan can last a few months and up to a year. Um, these four tips can really help you develop a new hire training plan that gets your new employee settled in. Uh, first, you wanna consult with existing employees on what should be included in the training. That's the best place to, place to start in developing a new hire training plan is with those who are already trained, who've already been trained, especially those who excel in their current roles. Consult your employees who work in roles similar to that of your new hire uh, and get their feedback on what should be included. Number two is to be sure to make training flexible, task-oriented, and ongoing. No two hires are exactly the same, so training really should be dynamic enough to adapt to the strengths and weaknesses of each new employee. Uh, number three is to encourage team-level training. 
A team level training can help a new hire understand their own team's workflow, the reporting hierarchy of the team, day-to-day -day expectations of their role and more that a corporate level training might not cover. Um, it's also an opportunity to bring a new hire into the existing process, introducing them to the team members that they're gonna work closely with and any metrics used to track the team's productivity. And then finally, you want to accommodate each new hire's preferred learning method. People learn in different ways. So your new hire training plan should be adaptable to various learning styles. You, conforming to a new hire's preferred learning method can help your training stick more quickly, reducing the amount of instruction a new hire needs before they can perform their job effectively. So you're likely to see three main learning styles among new hires. Um, some visual learners, uh, some employees, some new hires prefer to learn processes by watching somebody else actively perform tasks the first time. Um, some prefer repetition. Other new hires need to have a hands-on approach to learning uh, and performing the tasks themselves several times before they can really commit it to memory. Uh, they also call that a kinesthetic learner, somebody who has to really, uh, really use hands-on to, to learn it best. And then reading. Some employees prefer to read a packet of written instructions and keep it on hand in their first few weeks on the job. Ideally, each, each task or function, you should try to incorporate each of these types of learning styles so that your, uh, your new hires can really kind of pick and choose what style works best for them. All right. And then once you've come up with, uh, you finished all of your um, onboarding uh, process steps, you really want to consider doing an onboarding process survey. So poor onboarding processes are among the most common reasons why new hires leave. Um, you may have set up procedures to welcome new employees, but you really can't be sure they're effective until you ask new hires about them. So use an onboarding process survey uh, can help you improve your process, address individual needs, and retain employees. Um, I created this one uh, using um, Microsoft uh, Office 365 forms, quick and easy tool to use. Um, and one point is to always keep in mind that anything you're sending, remember that most people or more people are using their smartphones uh, to access a lot of this. So make sure whatever you're providing uh, can be uh, easily viewed both on a, on a laptop or computer screen, but also on a smartphone. All right. So I'm going to turn it over now to Amanda to talk about the challenges with remote onboarding. Thank you, Sherry. Um, that's definitely some great information. And I do want to also say that I feel I think the onboarding process, whether it's remote or in, in office, is a, something that's always going to be a work in progress. So you always want to kind of take a look at what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, Sherry had mentioned consulting your current employees on you know, what was effective and what could have been changed and, you know, really being receptive to that feedback. So we're going to talk about remote onboarding and some things that we've learned and some state and federal considerations for wage and employment laws as well. So some things that we have learned. Um, so one day, I, I think like probably many of you, we were in the office and then the next day we were 100% remote. So you know, we really had to adjust to this new work environment. And with onboarding new hires, what had worked before didn't necessarily transition to this new virtual environment and wasn't as effective. So when we were in the office, like Sherry said, we had the ability to walk new hires around and introduce them to everyone. People were able to put that face with the name and, you know, identify their new team members. But now, you know, it's a lot more challenging you know, we were able to immerse them in our culture and make them feel like part of the team, but how do you do that remotely? We've learned that it was beneficial for remote hires, like Sherry mentioned, to have a mentor. Our new hires would be tasked with shadowing team members and different departments to learn the company as a whole. So not just their team, but also other departments and build that relationship. So if they had questions, they had someone that they felt comfortable to go and ask. We'd also send out um, Teams messages that would introduce new hires because we were finding that as the company grew, there were so many new hires. So when a client would mention someone's name, I personally was confused. Was this a, an employee of ours or theirs? So um, there was definitely some confusion as we started to grow. 
And the team members were, you know, introduced to different shadowing opportunities, um, and that definitely helped out with that. And normally we would meet once a month with our team, the HR team in the office. But, you know, kind of going to this virtual environment, that increased to three times a week. And, you know, I do think that there is meeting overload. So having a purpose for each of these meetings is definitely important. This gave us all the ability to feel connected, to reference our team members for questions, you know, especially during the ever-changing landscape of this pandemic. And we would also assign different HR partners each week to work with the new hire that's on our team and kind of show them the best HR practices, meetings and training so that they would have a full scope of their position. And for the company, what was a quarterly meeting, it turned into an every Friday morning meeting to give company updates. So this would be introducing new hires, um, some things that the company was working on and just a way to kind of keep all of us engaged and connected. So some things that I wanna review are um, gonna be Zoom etiquette. Now, this is something that I actually asked someone that was onboarded remotely, you know, what are some things that were challenging when you started? And this was something that I didn't even think of, whether it's a connected platform or if it's Zoom, what are the expectations of having your camera on? You know, is it, are you expected to have it on all times? Is it okay to have your camera off, off and on? And also dress code, working remotely, you know, what is the dress code expectation? Is it still business casual? Or is it, you know, you, you're able to have a sweatshirt on when you're not client facing and really communicating that so that that is not a great area for your employees. Um, expectations. So as far as, you know, do you just call someone? Can you just say we use Teams here and is it okay to just call someone or, you know, is it preferred that you set up or schedule a meeting with them first? Do you send them a message and say, hey, do you have time? Or is it okay to just, you know, dial them up and expect a face-to-face? -face? And then any resources that would be helpful, um, like who do you call if you have any questions or, you know, when something should be escalated to management. And as part of the onboarding here, there are some other considerations for your remote employees, and this is going to include Form I-9. Um, employers are expected to verify employment eligibility by reviewing original documents. So, you know, we're used to looking at those original documents in person and filling out page two of the I-9, but the Immigration Reform and Control Act does not permit employers to use copies or pictures of documents. So, you know, you can't ask an employee just to photocopy it and send it to you if they are a remote employee um, or video technology even. So, this presents unique challenges for remote employees. In order to comply with the I-9 requirements, an employer can designate someone local to act as an agent to review the document and complete the I-9. And there are several services available throughout the country, or you can use any notary to do so as well. Then we also wanna consider workers' compensation. Generally, states require that employer register for you know, workers comp and to obtain compensation insurance in the state where the employee is performing the services. So it's important to contact your workers car compensation carrier or broker to make sure that your remote employees are going to be covered by your work workers comp insurance. Um, that's something that I don't think everyone thinks of. So some states like Ohio, for example, requires a separate workers comp policy for remote workers. And then there's also disability insurance. So as you grow throughout the states, um, a number of states require employers to participate in state disability programs. Um, states like New York require them to have a benefit through their insurance carrier. And other states such as you know, New, Jer New Jersey are provided by the state and you have to obtain that through the state. There are also state withholdings. So most states have their own withholding forms that need to be included in your new hire package such as in Massachusetts, we have the M4 that should be provided in addition to the federal W4. So keep that in mind as well. And employers should be mindful. Uh, we can go ahead and skip to the next one, Jerry. Thank you. Employers should be mindful that the employment laws in the state where a remote employee is working generally will apply to the employment relationship. So let's take a look at some of the employees employment laws that employers should be aware of when hiring remote employees. You have to consider employment posters. Um, employers are required to post, you know, from various federal, state, 
local employment laws. And usually we put these posters in the office, but when you have a remote employee, that makes it kind of challenging. And so, you know, you can either post them electronically on the company's internet site, or you can email them to your remote employees. Uh, also required notices. So many states have, you know, and notices that have to be provided to employees at hire. In Massachusetts, we have the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. We also have the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, the Earned Sick Time. Um, so we usually use these in the handbook. Uh, we usually put some of these policies in the handbook to satisfy that requirement, but others need to be given to employees at hire. So you have to keep in that in mind. And in California, it's it's pretty nuts. There's nine required notices for new hires. So, you know, really staying on top of what needs to be provided. There's also local and state leaves. So um, many states and local laws require employers to provide paid and or paid time off for sick, you know, parental leave, domestic violence leave, family medical leave, and a host of other job protected leaves. So you wanna know what leaves um, are available to your employees in the states that they're working. Then we also have the harassment training requirements. And you know, right now there is a requirement for employees and managers to have a specific training in California, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maine, New York State, and even New York City. And then you also want to take into consideration the pay frequency. So for many states like Massachusetts, we require non-exempt employees to be paid on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis, but do not permit exempt employees to be paid less frequently than that. Um, so states also have some different requirements as to when employees must be paid after the close of the pay period. You know, in Massachusetts, we have to pay employees um, six days of the close of the pay period. And each state has different requirements. And, you know, even Connecticut only allows for weekly pay frequency unless there's a waiver from the labor commissioner. Um, and so keeping that in mind and checking pay frequency. So just because you pay biweekly doesn't mean that that's going to be compliant in all the states that you have employees in. There's also minimum wage requirements, and it doesn't also it doesn't also pertain to just the state, but you also have to even take that down and look at the cities and counties that you have employees in, because you know in California there are 30 cities with their own minimum wage requirements. Um, so some minimum wage laws even vary by the number of employees you have. So not only where you have employees, but the number of employees that you have. Overtime pay requirements also differ from state to state. And under federal law, overtime must be paid for all hours in excess of 40, I'm sure as you all know. But in California, non-exempt employees have to be paid overtime if they work more than eight hours in a workday. So keeping that in mind too. And then we have the final page pay requirements or wage payments. Um, and it's no surprise by now that the final wage payments also differ by state. And many states differentiate final wage payments and requirements depending on the termination. Is it voluntary or involuntary? And so you can see the difference between in Massachusetts, if there's an involuntary termination, they have to be paid at the time of termination. Whereas in New Hampshire, if an employee quits or gives at least one pay periods notice, they have to be paid within 72 hours of termination. In addition to final pay, many states require notices or termination letters, as well as unemployment information to be distributed at that time of termination. So to summarize, take a look at each individual's work location and assure you're complying with all the required regulations. And now we're gonna talk about <clears throat> some onboarding tips and some things that we've kind of seen that have worked or some suggestions to, to help you out. And so we have um, something that we do here, which is a new hire spotlight. Please, um, my, mine is kind of vague that I have put up here. Um, you know, I could have expounded on the information a little bit, but, you know, basically ask employees to introduce themselves, create, you know, a spotlight for even your current employees so that some of your new hires get to see, the, you know, who, who they work with and what their job duties are. Um, and, you know, ask some fun questions. Don't make it all work related. You know, come up with a bunch of questions that employees can choose from to answer that kind of gets everyone to feel like they're part of the team and also they get to know who they work with. 
and create some commonalities to have some conversations. All right. And so I really like this idea. So I thought we'd share it with you today. And it's called a field guide or rules of the road. I had one client calling it a field guide, another client calling it rules of the road. And this is just an example of what would help acclimate employees to your workforce. So if you think of the employee handbook and everything in it, there's a lot of information. But it's kind of, this is more meant to be anything that is outside of the employee handbook. So you want to maybe put things in there like any annual company events, maybe include pictures from the last few years, um, list out some charities that the company supports or community service that the company is involved with. Um, I even remember when I started, I wasn't sure what printer to use. So I would try all the different ones and spend a few few minutes looking for the document that I printed. So things like that, that could help out employees and mentioning that to them, as well as some company core values, if you have them, and a brief summary as to why they're important. And then also if snacks or beverages are provided in the office, you know, tell the employees what, what is provided, what they can expect, you know, are there beverages or coffee or anything like that? And, you know, if we're going to talk about remote employees, consider joining a snack club where they send your remote employees some snacks too, to really include them and keep things consistent. You can even put in there some good places to eat that are local to the office. Um, like Sherry had talked about different, you know, where do you go even to take a, take a personal phone call? Where's a place that you can have quiet work done? How do you book conference rooms? Things like that. And if you think about the company as a whole, think about what's not in the employee handbook that could be beneficial for a new hire to know. And also think about when you started and you know what, what you needed to know that wasn't necessarily information that was provided to you on day one. Some other tips that I wanted to add in are you know, having a company organizational chart or directory this is really going to be instrumental in helping identify team members and what department they work in. I know, you know, as you grow, there's always someone new or someone may have left and, um, you know, even consider having like a photo of them next to it so that they can really connect everyone together. And when you have a hybrid team, some employees, if, if you have some remote employees working remotely and some employees in the office, um, try having everyone do a Zoom meeting from their desk instead of everyone congregating in a conference room and dialing in your remote employees. This can help them kind of feel like, you know, they're less secluded. Um, like I had mentioned, we use Teams as a connected platform, but there's many other connected platforms out there that you all use, but that could be a good way to really connect employees. And you can reach out or have a video call with each other. And remember, part of the office environment is the social aspect. Um, you know, what I miss most is, you know, Monday mornings, we used to always get together in the HR office and catch up on the weekend. Um, you know, when we're working remotely, some of that doesn't transfer over. So I think it's still important to have sm a small talk with your coworkers and, you know, talk about the weekend and really, you know, have that part of your culture and encourage it. So schedule time for employees to catch up for a non-work related phone call, you know, and just kind of have that. I think so many times we get on meetings and we jump right into the information. I think it's important to still have those pleasantries in the beginning and um, include that small talk. Considering having a new hire site where employees can go for resources, links re related to the company. And this in can include what Sherry mentioned, you know, a central document that they can store all the links and schedules for your new hire. So if you're looking to include someone or call them to check up on them, you kind of know where everything is and it's housed in the same area. And another thing to mention is that if you offer benefits to your on-site employees, such as gym memberships or reimbursement for anything like that, consider offering the similar benefit for your remote employees. Um, so like I said, you know, snacks in the office, try to see if there's a snack club out there so that they feel like they're, they're getting the same benefits as being on site. With that, we're gonna go over to some questions that we have certainly got in. So thank you everyone for your participation in that. Um, there are sure questions in here. Yeah, so, so uh, there's two questions that are kind of the same thing. So one says, is it unfair to expect new hires to do this work before being paid? And the other says, are there any concerns about needing to pay employees for completing paperwork before they start? So it's a really, really good question. 
So first off, um, for uh, non-exempt employees, your hourly employees, they do have to be paid for all time worked. Um, but completing some of these forms is what um, the uh, Department of Labor refers to as de minimis time, just a little bit of time that you're spending really isn't necessarily compensable time required to be paid. The other thing is, is you wanna make it clear when you're sending this out that um, you know this is you know th that it will help them get a head start, but not necessarily required. Some people either don't might not have if you're doing electronic onboarding like we do, um, you somebody may not have uh, the resources to do that until they receive their company laptop and all of that. So um, you really kind of have to play that by ear. But um, having people just uh, do a little bit of uh, you know sending them the handbook and benefit information, you're not requiring them to read it all, but you're giving them the opportunity to, to, to uh, take a look at that stuff before they start. So it's really not that much of a concern. Now, if you are giving them uh, work to do, uh, you know, training to do, testing to do, things like that, that would definitely be compensable time. All right. I, I like this. this other question, Sherry, that says, when you're hiring in batches or groups, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? There's going to be so much effort that one person has to put in to train and how time consuming it is. How do you optimize your staff in working with new hires? Yeah, and that's, you know, and that really is going to depend, some of it's depending on your structure. So um, we oftentimes at MP will bring on a, you know, a few different people in a few different departments that might all start, you know, on the same day. In that case, Oftentimes they'll be, so um, when new hires start, even if they're not on the HR team, uh, we do an introduction to our HR services. So all of our team members know what we do. Um, so that might be everybody together, that batch or group training. Um, same thing with some of the basic orientation stuff. Like if you're doing a, a presentation on, on benefits or, or going over the employee handbook uh, on their first day, those, those are fine activities to do in batches or all together. Um, but then there are certain things that really need to be separate, which is why it's really handy to have some mentors assigned so that you can then um, schedule that individualized and role specific training. That's great. Yeah. Um, we also have a question that says for internal preparation, you had suggested team members to reach out. So would you suggest having an email waiting for them in their company email or having the team members to reach out on the employee for the first day? You know, you know what I remember so distinctly, um, Amanda. You probably do too. Um, when when we first started years ago at at, at MP, um, we were all predominantly in the Beverly office. Um, and when a new person would start, um, an email would go out um, to the entire <laughs> company. You know, we were like thirty five people, right? So we would get an email saying, you know, welcome aboard, Amanda Bridge. She's starting on Monday, and then all <laughs> thirty five people would hit reply all. Um, and and send their welcome message, which was really lovely, but it really got out of hand. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank goodness for teams that we use. It really is very helpful uh, to make sure that um, that we're not we're not doing that. But um, what I was talking about is in reference to this is before they start. So yes, it's nice for, to have a, a welcome in, on in, say in your teams um, or in in your in your um, community platform to welcome people, but I was talking about even before they start. So the people um, that have interviewed the individual, once they're hired, maybe that person, those people can reach out to congratulate them. Again, if you are on your, you know, somebody's gonna be starting on your team, look them up on LinkedIn, connect on LinkedIn. Um, that's that's what the site is there for, professional connections. Uh, so connect and send them a, a, an instant or direct message, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, it's really nice if you can, to let them know before they start how excited you are to have, have them joining the team. Right. And let's see. Um, and do you have recommendations as to how to differentiate between responsibilities of the direct supervisor versus the buddy or mentor, especially in the first few weeks? Um, and that's a good question. And again, it really is going to depend on your team structure and the, and the, and the job and the tasks involved. But, um, you know, the direct supervisor really should be doing more of a check-in and sort of overseeing, almost like quarterbacking the whole thing, um, whereas the buddy or mentor is really the, are the people who are going to be 
directly doing the training. So for example, we have our, um, you know, our, our um, the VP of um, HR services, he will assign uh, each of us. So he, when we have a new teammate starting, um, each of us uh, gets a week assigned, each of the HR partners gets assigned a week where we are the mentor for that new hire. Um, and so that they will uh, we'll check in with them in the morning and then again in the afternoon. Uh, we'll invite them to any of our meetings or trainings that we're doing so that they can observe. Um, and then we'll work with them on uh, specific pieces of, of, of the tasks that we do. So for example, we use Salesforce um, which we have to, um, uh, you know, put all of our activity in. So, you know, teaching them how to do that, uh, things like that, where our SharePoint, where we share all of our documents and things, you know, introducing them. So that's usually the function of the buddies or mentors, uh, where the direct supervisor or manager is generally kind of coordinating all of that effort. Let's see, did I skip anything there, Amanda? I think we got them all. All right. Well, it looks like I think we have uh, all the questions answered. So uh, we're going to give you nine minutes back in your day. Mm -hmm. Yay. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Katie to uh, wrap us up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sherry and Amanda. Lots of valuable information on onboarding. The MPHR team is here to help guide your organization on any HR compliance issues. If you would like to learn more about how we can assist your organization, please visit our website to set up a short 15-minute call. Be sure to join us next week on the same day and time for our webinar on employee retention in 2022, key tactics and proven strategies. Visit our website to register and see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out a recording of today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thanks for joining us and have a terrific day.